afternoon and welcome back to the Industry 4.0 and Sustainable Supply Chain stage here at COGEX. I am Katz Keeley, I'm the CEO of Beep and founder of Frontline.Live and I am your MC for this stage for this final day. It's been the most fascinating and insightful conversations over the last couple of days and I'm expecting What's going to be happening just about now will be even better still, and I'm super excited about this next session. So this crisis has shone a big, bright light on the widening faults in the current system. It's shown that we need to fundamentally change the way we do things. We need to have a better balance between people, planet, and profit. We need to start thinking systematically. We are in this together, and that's not just another hashtag. So this next session is going to be about the circular economy 2030. How do we get our systems and supply chains to become really sustainable? And with that, I'll hand you over to Becky Clark, who is the Senior Digital Sustainability Consultant at Perform Green. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this session. Um, I'm Becky Clark, um, Senior Consultant at Perform Green, the Smart Society Consultancy, and you're listening to the Circular Economy 2030 panel. Um, I have the honour of setting the scene and introducing our wonderful speakers to you today, and we will have a great discussion this afternoon. Um, so, circular business models tackle the entire life cycle of products, uh, challenging the decisions made in design, aiming to keep the resources in the economy for as long as possible. Um, now, why do this? Uh, avoiding extraction and primary production, focusing on remanufacturing can help us all towards climate targets, net zero places, create jobs and professions, and lead us towards that more sustainable future, um, which is a hot topic right now with lots of potential for the new green industrial revolution for recovery. Um, we've got a poll over to the side on how familiar you are with the concepts of circular economy and how familiar your customers are. Um, it would be great to benchmark where you are in your journey, but don't worry, uh, we will start with a few of the key concepts. Um, now, the speakers that we have for you today are all fantastically placed to give you perspectives on circularity and the benefits that it can have for our economy and the environment. Um, I'd like to introduce our speakers one by one and ask them a question um, about their unique perspective on the circular economy. Um, so please welcome um, to the stage uh, Juan Jose Frejo, the Global Director of Sustainability for Brambles. Now, Brambles Circular Business Model perpetuates the sharing and reuse of the world's largest pool of reusable pallets and containers. Uh, they've recently been named the most sustainable company, receiving the highest score in the Dow Jones Barron's Sustainability Bank, uh, Ranking, rating them as the most sustainable company globally. Um, Juan, welcome. <laughs> Juan Jose, welcome. Thank you very much. How are you doing? Um, so for those who might be in the early stages of getting to grips with this circular economy ideas, would you mind running through some of the basic concepts with Brambles as an example? Yes, it will be my pleasure. So yeah, probably we should clarify first that we should define what we mean with circular economy for those of you who are not experts in the matter or, or who didn't have a lot of contact with it. It's a word that we use all the time lately, but what does it actually mean? And for me, circular economy is an alternative. It's an alternative to an existing system, to the system that we have used for the last two centuries to operate production, to operate industrial activities. Since the Industrial Revolution, we have been operating with this model called, I, 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 put, I, I created here some, some uh, very technological slides, um, the linear model. This is what we have been using, a model based on this very basic structure, take, make, dispose. We take resources from the nature, we make things, we make objects, and then when we don't want them anymore, we dispose of them. And the model has been incredibly successful. I mean, uh, before the Industrial Revolution, some studies says that the average citizen in, uh, in Europe could have a couple of hundred objects, that's it. Today, it's uh, hundreds of thousands of ob objects that, that an average household has today. So if we are measuring in, 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 in as the capabilities of producing, it's been phenomenal, but we've reached the limits. We've reached the limits of the, of, the, of the linear system. Why? Because this system assumes that the Earth, the planet, is an infinite source for resources. You can take as much as you want. This take, uh, this take action is infinite. And also at the same time, it assumes that the Earth is an infinite landfill where you can put waste and waste and waste and nothing will happen. We know that that is not true anymore. 
on the, on, on the part of the input, for example, we have the big problems with deforestation and the lack of natural resources in some areas. For the size of the output, of the output, well, uh, many examples. Climate change with CO2 is one, but also if we talk about plastics and single-use plastic, uh, you see that horrible island, three times the size of France that we have in the Pacific Oceans, made out of waste. So the system is broken. We, we need to think differently, otherwise it will collapse. Circular economy is an alternative to this way of thinking. It's based on, on a concept, it's based on a model in which waste is forbidden. There is no waste, okay? Circular economy, if we have a problem with the inputs and with the outputs, why don't we close the loop? Why don't we, do we make that the, the output, the waste, is actually a nutrient that we can put back into the system? That is the basic concept behind it. And I would like to say that this goes beyond the typical recycling. This is about creating business model and business operations and industrial activities that actually works. It's the, I like, I'll always like to highlight the term economy in the term circular economy, uh, because this is about creating profitable business models. And, um, and maybe I'm here today to, to, to also share with you that this is possible. There are models already, there are businesses already working there, like, like our business, which is operating in a circular way. I, I work for a company called Brandles and uh, that has an, a, an operating brand called Chep. The next time you go to a supermarket, I would like for you to, to look at the floor and to look for pallets, and you will probably see some blue pallets. That's us. Pallets is a part of packaging, but part a pallet is an element of tertiary packaging, of industrial packaging. And today you need, you need packaging to move things across the supply chain. And basically you have a couple of options. You have two options if you want to use packaging. You can buy a piece of packaging, a pallet or a, or a crate or a container and then dispose of it linear when you have used it, or you can rent it. This is what we do. We give services on uh, industrial packaging, specifically on pallets. We rent out pallets. So we give the pallet to a manufacturer, they put their goods on, on the pallet, it goes all the way through the supply chain until it reaches the supermarket, the distributor, the retailer. And then, because the pallet is ours, we don't sell it, we rent it out, we make sure that we collect it, we fix it if needed, and we give it to another manufacturer. A simple and very pure circular business model. And this is repeated over and over and over again. It's very simple. But now I would like you, for you mentally, now that you have this model in mind, to multiply it by 300 million units. This is what we do. Today, as we speak, there are 300 millions of units of reusable packaging that tomorrow they will be collected through our reverse logistics capabilities, traceability, and hopefully we will talk about that. And they will be used by, by another place. No, this is where the sharing economy and the circular economy comes together through this uh, business model. So we've been doing this for years, even before the term circular economy was, in, was, uh, was invented. And, and this is not so much about us. It's about bringing the idea and bringing the fact that this can be done. It is possible to build successful operating business models that, that, that work under this circular economy umbrella and, and concept. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fantastic. And I think um, what we're going to see a lot of in the future and, and hopefully now as well is that idea of packaging as a service as the thing that you would normally buy as a service. So, um, yeah, that's that really fantastic. And we will definitely come back to that um, in a moment. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Fiona Place. Um, Fiona Place is the Sustainable Supply Chain Management Practitioner at Anthesis Group, working on the evidence base for supply chain strategy, targeted design of solutions for clients. Um, hello, Fiona. Hello, Becky. Hi. Um, so, given what you do at Anthesis and what Anthesis does for, for its clients, how would you suggest an organisation get started with getting to grips with their supply chain, um, let alone adding circularity to it? Yeah, excellent question, Becky. So I think, uh, you know, again, uh, a li little bit like uh, Juan Jose, you know, we start with the concept of looking at circular economy um, in the context of three elements. So looking at sustainable production, sustainable consumption and effectively responsible citizenship. So what that means in practice 
is that we need to engage all points of the stakeholder ownership and life cycle um, of a production or packaging item. So effectively uh, engaging along all nodes of the supply chain. So for us, critically, organisations need to map the supply chain um, to understand uh, who the various actors are within that supply chain, uh, the material flows right through from sourcing to manufacturing onto distribution and then critically disposal. Um, and uh, a lot of the work that we're engaged in there is to segment that supply chain. And what we really mean is uh, to understand um, all of the different impacts that that product has right from the moment of design through to uh, production and then on to end of life to understand uh, where action can be taken. Um, so that might be uh, considering the types of material inputs that you've got, where you may be using virgin materials, are there alternatives for substitution, et cetera, um, right through to looking at how materials are disposed of at end of life around uh, you know, repair, reuse, um, or recycling. So um, the, really the first step is actually understanding who sits within your supply chain and, and mapping that out. And that's no easy task, you know, for um, example, when we're working with clients in the apparel sector, we could be looking at something like 12 tiers of different uh, actors starting from, um, you know, the farmers, the agri-producers, um, sourcing, for example, cotton wool equivalent. Then it goes on to cleaning, processing, uh, spinning, uh, before it goes to weaving, dyeing, um, and then actually sort of cutting uh, and uh, manufacture of garments and then distribution. And there are all of these opportunities along those uh, nodes of the supply chain to look at um, effectively the types of materials that are being used, the durability of those products, and effectively how they can be disassembled at the end of the process um, to ensure that effectively uh, those materials can be put to secondary uses, effectively secondary commodities. Um, so, you know, this is a complex uh, requirement and uh, obviously we'll be exploring some of the digital ways in which uh, you can support that process, uh, but clearly getting to grips with uh, understanding who's in your supply chain um, is a critical first step. Brilliant, yes, thank you. Yeah, um, sounds as though communicating across the entire supply chain and as you say, understanding who sits in it, the transparency um, around that is a great opportunity to um, introduce uh, Jesse Baker. Um, so Jesse is the founder and CEO of Social Enterprise Provenance. Providence help leading consumer goods businesses like Unilever and Pernod Ricard to build brand trust through uh, supply chain and impact transparency. Hi, Jesse. Hi, Becky. Hi. So it sounds as though we've uh, we've touched on the need that you saw and, and how you stepped into that need, um, which led to your business Providence. Um, so yeah. So so how important is the availability and, and quality of data to a circular business model? Yeah, no, great question. I mean, for me, circular economy is a huge step change in in the economy. I mean, it's a completely new model, um, as, as has already been well set out. And for me, that means we need to think about systems, system thinking, to embrace the complexity that really is there with the circular economy. Uh, and for me, that's why I think at the heart of the solution of enabling it is, is data. Um, and, uh, you know, the, sure, we, we talk a lot about kind of innovation in materials and how vital that is in order to close the loop. But actually, I think the real um, important area for innovation is in how we share the information about those materials and create connected systems to be able to deal with the complexity. So, yeah, Providence has come from a background um, working in the food and drinks industry, um, mostly with consumable products that uh, luckily, uh, if you've got a compost, um, are already designed to be uh, to be circular. Um, and so, yeah, we, we really work with businesses to help them to be more transparent. And for, for, for us, that really means public disclosure um, of credible, comparable um, data that really can be can be trusted about products and where they come from. And so we've spent a long time looking backwards in the supply chain at the provenance, where things have come from, how they've been created. And actually, more recently, we've started to look uh, holistically at not only where products have come from, but also where they end up. Uh, starting uh, as a request from, from many of the food and drinks companies we work with to look at packaging um, and then since then gone beyond that to work with businesses that are designing truly circular products that want to have the data trail 
um, to go along with their product so that you can see exactly the materials that you're now a custodian of um, when you buy a product, but also can help facilitate the, the closing the loop. Um, I think we forget how important it is that, that uh, the consumers, the traditional consumers are now going to become suppliers uh, back into the system. And so creating that data link, um, which is often not there, particularly for many brands that sell through manufacturers, um, it is absolutely vital in order to be able to help get those products back into the system, whether that's with the original brand and manufacturer or whether that's through new infrastructure um, designed to take back in products. Um, so yeah, we very much come from that, that point of view, helping create the, the open data systems um, in order to be able to, to enable a circular economy. Fabulous. Yeah, the, the message I'm, I'm definitely getting here is um, look at the uh, whole supply chain, see who sits in the supply chain, the transparency around that. Um, and um, let's add in some complexity here. <laughs> so let's introduce Greg Lawton. Um, so Greg is the co-founder of Nodes and Links, um, the world leader in applying complexity research to complex project delivery. Um, they're actually up for two awards in this uh, year's COGX Awards, the best AI in next generation infrastructure and the best innovation in simulations, and have recently entered a global partnership with um, Mott McDonald. So yeah, Greg, let's introduce complexity science um, and the perspective that you bring. Um, so let's start with how we would define complex systems and uh, how you would go about taming them. Beautiful, beautiful. Uh, great to be here. So what I'm going to try and do is I'm actually going to try and make the complex simple here. And what I'd say is that uh, complexity science is an emerging area of, of research that actually looks to quantify and explain um, the properties that we're just uh, hearing from on the other panelists. So what is a complex system? So very simply, a, a complex system is one that has many components and it has many interactions between its components and those components um, behave in certain ways with each other and that behavior can emerge as a system-wide behavior and it's very very difficult to know how the whole system's going to behave without looking at all of those individual components and having a look at all of those individual interactions. So a perfect example of this is the human cell, the human body. Another example is the financial system. Another example, which is where we sit, is in complex project delivery. So where you have tens of thousands of activities across thousands of suppliers, across millions of assets, etc. cetera. Um, and the most recent one, obviously, is uh, the emergence of a pandemic from what started obviously as a patient zero, which is an individual infection. Now, the easiest way to conceptualize all of this is thinking of it as a network. It's a network of things. So to bring in the perspective of the other panelists, so Juan, you were talking about, you know, the movement of a pallet throughout the supply chain. Well, you know, each node would be a place where that pallet ends up and the link would be the travel between them bringing in Fiona's view uh, about mapping all the movements of all the products in the supply chain, and then you've got your integrated network. And then bringing Jesse there, it's putting the time element to that and seeing how everything moves over time, so how the system behaves. Um, but knowing how a system behaves is just one part of the battle. We've then got the second part of the battle, which is, right, so how do we control this, control this thing? Um, and key thinking here is that to accept we're never actually going to be fully in control of these complex systems. They're not linear. You you can't hit them with a stick and they behave in the way you want them to behave. A uh, perfect example, this is medicine. There's lots of side effects to lots of drugs. You can't just get a, a drug that cures a disease with no side effects. Now, what we can do, though, is start to map them and understand them to understand how we can um, use emergence in our favor so a perfect example of this is uh you know juan if you're incentivizing people through the supply chain to use your renew uh, reusable system rather than you know buying and then disposing financially for example that is an incentive that causes a change in behavior um and i'll, I'll just end with a couple of terms that if you ever hear these terms Generally, it means that someone is talking about a complex system. And these terms are obviously complexity, emergence, resilience, and resistance. You know, and those are two all of us will be have heard on the news in the last couple of 
months um, and are very, very critical to what's going on around the world now. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll, hand, I'll hand back. Yeah, thank you very much. Right. Hello, everybody. <laughs> We're all in this together. Um, so thinking thinking that end point of resilience um, and, and perhaps a business um, or organization listening to this and thinking, OK, sounds interesting. I get why one a person would want to do this, why a business would want to move in this direction. Um, but what about uh, risks um, in the supply chain and, and, the, and the sort of treatment of risk? You've got your supply chain nice and neat how you like it, you understand it all. When you change things, you introduce uncertainty and um, complexity. So yeah, who would like to go for um, a sort of risk management, risk risk awareness question? <laughs> Greg? Well, I, who wants to say that? I can jump straight in. Mm -hmm. Okay, beautiful. So um, uh, first of all, it's thinking about what is our what is our total goal of, of this system, a supply chain system? So um, if, you know, it can be sustainability, it can be efficiency, it can be anything. Obviously, we're having a conversation about sustainability, so let's pick that one. Now, our goal is to be sustainable across time, which fundamentally means that what our goal is, is to be sustainable across a number of different states. So you're going to have a perfect day, you're going to have some bad days, you know, some days it's going to rain, some days it's going to not, some days suppliers are going to deliver, some days they're not, etc. But our goal is to have the best system across that that whole period of time. Um, risk really comes about when uh, there is variance in in you know that that whole system. Where we can accidentally amplify risk is where we try and optimize for a single system. So where we try to be overly lean in the the whole process, because if we're overly lean we're assuming that the long tails don't exist. That, you know, a pandemic will never happen in this world. And what we fundamentally do is we decrease the resilience and resistance of the system to actually withhold sh shocks or recover quickly from shocks. So one of the key thinking now in, in you know, complex system thinking and supply chain, et cetera, is where's the optimum point of leanness and then where do we need to have a bit of buffer to allow for for that level of variance and also how do we how do we actively track these these supply chains these systems over time to make sure that we're aware of when things could potentially be going be going awry so w what i do think is that this level of thinking is going to be front and center of uh, risk management in companies for the next 10 years you know 2020 is the year of complex systems failures it is really what it is about and people are going to be really putting this at the forefront of board level thinking yeah if i could just just build on that sorry sorry on jose uh but just very quickly i think the um the critical thing here is about businesses sort of understanding which region or brand or product is actually causing or driving the most impacts um, and therefore being able to actually cut across to understand which materials or technologies are driving that impact in order, in order to identify the key suppliers who could actually be engaged to address these risks because effectively for every risk there's also an opportunity um, and uh, you know with shortening of supply chains which uh, we're starting to see in certain instances um, as a as an output from the COVID-19 pandemic um, also rationalization of the number of lines um, which all feeds into actually uh, the piece around sort of circularity and reimagining sort of product design um, you know we we need to consider what is needed to potentially reduce these risks but conversely where the sort of new frontiers lie and the new opportunities within that um, so the simplification of supply chains um, you know certainly uh, can uh, and will contribute in part to to addressing some of these issues yeah and just if, if you allow me I, I think you touched on a very important point which is the opportunity field I mean, think, when we do sustainability, when we do circular economy, thinking just about risks, that's all sustainability. In the old days, we used to be 
uh, we used to care about reducing, reducing waste, reducing the impacts in the environment, etc. Of course, we need to do that. But sustainability and circular economy is not just for that. It's about finding new opportunities. And I'm really happy to see that lately, even in the risk man in, in the risk departments of big companies, of our company, our company in particular, we are looking as much as opportunities as we are doing it with um, uh, with risks. This is about being more efficient. This is about uh, this is about creating differentiators. This is about opening new fields for having more revenue. This is the real value of of, of what it brings. So so again, I, I invite everyone to change a little bit the mindset. Of course, take care about the risks, and that is the basic line. But then immediately after those are solved, go into the opportunity field with things like like like, like I just said. Great. I totally agree with you, JJ. I think there's um, huge opportunities here. I, I think the tricky bit there, though, and I think from companies we've worked with, like a lot of our work is about taking things that are traditionally reducing bottom line, um, reducing risk, increasing efficiency and helping them use that to grow their brand, grow brand value, grow brand trust, communicate with a new Gen Z a uh, millennial customer that wants to see more information about the impact of the products they're buying. But I think the tricky bit here comes often with the, um, and I think circular economy, the economy being the key thing is the nature of the corporation, how businesses are set up today. Um, sure, at the top, there is one PL, but the whole business below that is separate PLs. And doing things like circular economy initiatives are not just about reducing risk and, and reducing uh, and, and increasing efficiency. They are also about appealing to a whole new type of customer and being relevant to them, which means collaboration across departments, um, it, departments that may never even spoken to each other, um, mm -hmm. which I think requires a fundamental shift in how, how companies operate if we're really going to respond to this. Yeah. Definitely, yeah, ending that silo thinking and instead having a horizontal, everyone is working towards the same goal. Um, interesting question here from the audience. Um, so Toby asks, which part of the supply chain are moving fastest to a circular model and which the slowest? Um, Juan Jose, from a practical point of view, perhaps you could um, answer this one. I can tell you that definitely in the packaging area, I mean, if we talk about the industries, uh, everything that is that is linked to, to a consumer and in particular the packaging area is under a revolution. It has to be circularized and we are we are experiencing the nice pressure of, of, of having to be more and more circular. But that is if we talk about different industries. But if the question is about what what segment of a whole supply chain I will say that the question is not completely correct, or, or, or maybe I think that you, if you want to really become circular, you cannot circularize just one small segment. No, this I wake up in the morning and I said, you know, I'm going to be circular with my in, in my small world. No, probably what you will be doing there is waste management, which is something different. I have some waste and I want to and I want to know what what I do with it. Uh, it has to be the whole supply chain. It has to be the whole supply chain. It has to be systemic. And I cannot stress since the very beginning, since the, since the design of the product to all the steps to what happened at the end of life of that product, because it has been designed and used in a way that 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 had that that, that holistic view. So um, I would say this is this is for me the North Star when when someone wants to to become more circular, to start a new business model, think systemically from the beginning to the end. Otherwise, the reach that, that you can have, the impact that you can have, it's uh, it will be it will be quite limited. And maybe if you allow me in all of these, there is always that in my experience is always forgotten, you know, in this systemic view with it, which is the reverse logistics. You know, apart from thinking systemically, having this great idea on the new material, you know, that will revolutionize the world, etc. This new product that no one think of. At the end, you need to recover your stuff. You know, you need to reuse it. You need to and, and reverse logistics is always because it is not sexy. You know, it is it, it is always the big forgotten one, and without that, the whole system cannot work properly. So that's just some thoughts. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Yes. And and Jesse, I think you had um, sort of an example of that. You mentioned that um, customers could eventually become your suppliers. Would you mind sort of expanding on that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so so Providence is, is more recently started working in circular economy and, and our, our first entry point was it was in packaging. Um, but uh, recently we've done a project working uh, with two Dutch companies, uh, Opping and Niaga. Um, who have taken an absolutely revolutionary approach to completely redesigning products. And they've started with the mattress 
um, I think 8.2 million mattresses just in the US alone make their way to, to landfill. Um, and, and of course, recently we've seen the explosion of the, you know, n name a first name and there's probably a mattress company. Um, and so, yeah, they, they've done a fantastic job completely redesigning that product for, for Take Back. And we've worked with them in order to make the supply chain fully transparent and also create that link between the product um, and the and the end consumer of the product. But I think this throws up um, actually really exciting opportunities, not only for, for the customer, avoiding waste and buying from a, a company that's, that's really taking care of materials. Um, but also, it, it, I think it raises an interesting dynamic now between the customer and the supplier. Uh, we're so used to in supply chains um, sourcing from suppliers we're not used to sourcing from our customers um, and what kind of that can do in terms of uh, pricing you know if you have you know 1.2 million products out with your customers uh, with a you know get five quid if you come back and, and trade them in incentive if you can flux that incentive uh, in line with the price of the materials like you suddenly create a whole new uh, way of sourcing and, and understanding kind of the prices for your your materials going into the system um, so I think there's just a myriad of kind of opportunities um, looking at creating products in this way from yeah reducing the, the the prices of materials customer engagement i think is a whole new new thing as well you've suddenly got a digital relationship to to your customer um through a product which uh, you know we've been talking about for a long time um in the tech world through internet of things and and, and conversations mm -hmm. like that but this is you know this is a real real catalyst for that on on millions of products rather than just your you know your occasional smart things um but yeah, no, it, that, that project products in market now. I'm happy to share around some, some links if people are interested. But it's um, for me a great example of, of a real circular economy in action. Very cool, very cool. Yeah, and um, so collaboration um, is, is is key. And um, it sounds as though when you're getting started or trying to get supply chains to be sustainable, um, then um, you have a job sort of convincing your partners um, across the whole supply chain. Um, has anyone got any? Um, sort of comments on, you know, how would you get partners on board, customers, suppliers, you know, how would you start those conversations? Um, I guess I'm looking at you, Juan Jose, is it? <laughs> yeah, sorry, I want to monopolize that, but uh, we have some actual experience of that. So, yeah, uh, once you build a circular business model, also, uh, you, can, you can build a lot of other opportunities based on those circular foundations, collaboration opportunities. And we are in a technical, in a technology, in a technology conference there. I should say that that technology is the key to unlock all these collaboration opportunities, and that is true, partially. There is one component that sometimes we forget that is indispensable to activate any collaboration, which is trust. You know, of course, you need to have the data. You need to have the the, the information to see where the collaboration could be, how to unlock all those opportunities. For instance, in our case because we have visibility of all the pallets, all the packaging going in one direction or another, it's a unique opportunity to create continuous loops of transportation, eliminating empty trucks. 20% of the trucks that are driven today in, in Europe, more than 20% are driven empty. If you have the visibility, you can say, okay, this is where I can match lanes and I can, and I can reduce cost, CO2 emissions and increase efficiencies, et cetera. Great, that's the data. The most difficult thing, and that takes years, is to build the trust. So we operate with open books. We operate with 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 this um, yeah with this uh, with this willingness to 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 work together and and uh, and that um, I mean we had technology for collaboration since since ten years, fifteen years ago. I remember that. But what really changed the the the, the market? What really changed and, and started a heal hold whole new landscape of opportunities. In our particular case, trust and credibility. Trust and credibility, super, super important. Yes, does anyone else want to weigh in on trust and credibility? Yeah, I mean, that, that links a little bit to our work as well. I was just going to uh, mention, I suppose, you know, we're here at a tech conference, so why not bring up some deep tech? I mean, mm. so, so Provenance has been working for a long time in the blockchain supply chain space and looking at how we might create trust through technology. Um, and I completely agree with JJ. I actually think trust is is such a complex topic and it's such an important foundation for so many of these things. that I don't think technology is just going to come along and <laughs> and remove the, the need from it. But it's certainly something we've thought a lot about. Like, it's not just about opening up the data and the systems. You have to have 
trust in those systems and a lot of our work has been focused on establishing credibility and proof when it comes to the impact of materials what the materials are um, making sure you can really trust that information because if we're now seeing this as a potential supply into somebody else's supply chain it's absolutely vital that, that the thing is the thing and um, and that data that data preservation and, and, and trust but also um, I think it's 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 also about creating relationships across networks like we're so we've seen amazing innovation at web scale right but they've all been uh you know essentially just a peer to peer um you know building on some of the points on complexity we have to try and create some trusted networks that go peer to peer to peer because supply chains don't don't uh you know have have lots of connections across them um and that yeah that's what we've spent a lot of time looking at provenance is how you can ensure trust and credibility when you're several degrees removed uh, along the supply chain Becky, if, if maybe I could sort of highlight that through an example that we've been working on that very much builds on what Jesse's been saying there. So um, one of the active programmes we're involved in at the moment uh, is Marine Shift 360. Um, and this basically is a programme run by the marine industry um, because effectively they've been under the spotlight to make advances in closed loop pr product design, um, moving away from uh, the take mate waste approach. Um, and critically, what, what those parties, so there's seven businesses um, across sort of plastics, across uh, actual sort of big uh, yachting companies, uh, resin companies, et cetera, have done is they've come together in order to uh, effectively quantify the environmental impacts um, of their products full life cycle. And so the, the actual uh, tool enables us to harness data on things like the bill of materials um, and all of the different uh, nodes of that uh, value chain in the production um, of those individual uh, products. Um, and that enables the user to make informed decisions at the design stage um, around how it can reduce the impact um, so obviously, you know, this goes back to increasing efficiency, reducing costs, but it's also about innovation and in design so that we're using materials for the, 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 you know, have got that potential for durability and for the future. And it's it's really fascinating process because it's completely relied on that need for peer to peer collaboration, sharing of information, data exchange, so that these individual entities aren't working in silos and that those different suppliers are coming together. And this has been actually motivated by consumer demand um, alongside expected changes to legislation. Um, so I think it's a really fascinating example for people to look at in terms of, um, you know, circular economy principles in practice. Um, and it draws on some of the uh, indicators method uh, developed by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation as part of uh, the EU Life Funded Project. Brilliant. Yes, thank you. That's a, that is a really good example. Um, and I recommend everyone um, check it out. Definitely. Um, so in the remaining time uh, that we have left, because time has absolutely flown. Um, so what's your sort of visions for a more circular system? Um, so if it was up to you, how would you um, how would you go about getting people to move in this direction? And what would that sort of look like? Um, who would like to go first? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Sorry. For me, there is one critical element, which is education. We are taught. We are. We, I mean, when we go to universities, to business school, we are. We are taught to think linearly. You know. I mean, I, I've, I've been. I mean, I've been lecturing in a, in, in 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 a couple of of, of universities, logistics, supply chain, etc. It's all linear. So at the end, the, 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 the people who is responsible for creating new business model for operating supply chains, etc., they think that way. Uh, young generations is a little bit different, but but for me, this needs to start with with teaching, with teaching the, this new way of thinking, this new of building systems. Otherwise, the, the limits of our thought process will be very narrow, and we will not uh, be able. So that for me is something that is very much forgotten. And we need to stress it as, as much as possible. That's what we're here today, by the way, to share the message. It is possible. Let's make it happen. Yeah, great. Um, so um, thinking about um, 
you know, moving moving on to a, a slightly different topic, I guess, um, is um, you know, if you if you manage to map your network, um, Greg, would, would you mind um, answering how you would go about sort of um, using complexity science on that network to um, to make it better to to um, to test it, I guess, and and to and to and to go for sure. That. Sure, and I'll I'll build on what Juan Han was saying there about uh, about education. So we're we're now living in the age of networks. You know, the biggest businesses in the world are are fundamentally businesses predicated on networks. So Google has mapped the World Wide Web, Facebook has mapped the social network, LinkedIn has mapped the um, professional networks, and the list goes on and on. You know, after the two thousand nine financial crisis. The uh, governments around the world and the banks around the world are now mapping the uh, financial networks. Um, you know, part of this is, is is in the requirements of the Basel frameworks. Um, that's what we're living in. And you know, talking about networks and talking about complexity is is just the next evolution in systems thinking, which has been in engineering and design for decades now. Um, and to actually start to understand these these complex systems isn't actually difficult at all to begin with. Uh, the first step is very, very simple. You just have to map it. Um, and if you can't map all of it, you map part of it. You know, you 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 take a stab and you you see um, what you can get done. So, you know, following a pallet all the way through to the end, looking at um, the whole, how the whole supply chains interconnect, um, and also looking at things like people and relationships and, and how the social network embedded on the business network can relate themselves. And then uh, the second step is, again, quite quite simple in reality, it's scenario testing. So you make hypotheses, you say, well, what if this happened in the world? And I now have my test network and I can play around with that. And then I'll say another, what, what about this other scenario? And what about this other scenario? And by you know, performing just some simple scenario-based testing, you can get actually quite an insightful view about how the network is going to behave over time. So if I wanted to look at a sustainability network, I could think about, you know, well, what if certain people in the supply chain behaved a certain way, right? Well, let's just have a think think about that. And then the final thing to do is to, uh, how do you actually put decisive action on these networks? Well, there's, there's really only two or three top level strategies that you can do. One is you rewire them. So, you know, you build a new uh, internet data center to put redundancy in the system, uh, for example. Or in the capital infrastructure projects world, you choose a new build strategy. So you you can create more resilience and robustness that way. If you can't rewire them or rewiring has, has hit a certain limit, then what you can do is um, give more resources or place focus to specific nodes uh, within the network. Um, so, you know, we can think about um, disease control or pandemic spreading, like there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of checks now at airports, but there isn't a check in your local supermarket, for example, because that is a key point of the transportation network. And with those basic strategies, um, almost any business can actually really start to get to grips with its its local environment and it, it, the network that it's dealing with. Brilliant, thank you. Yes, great response, and and thank you all um, for sitting and chatting with me. And um, hopefully, the audience has managed to to catch some uh, key takeaways um, about thinking about w uh, waste that um, that is in a product process differently. Um, you know, not as waste, but as a nutrient into the system, and that collaboration really is is key to this. And understanding um, behaviour, building in resilience. Um, into the supply chain as well. Um, I would like to thank you all. Um, thank you ever so much for um, attending today. And uh, thank you to the audience uh, for listening. We are now going to take a short break and then we will be in the Q&A breakout session. So the questions that, um, that I haven't gotten around to on the side, um, we will take those into that session. Um, so I will see you uh, very shortly. Thank you. What an absolutely fantastic conversation. Thank you so much. There is nothing more important than the conversation you've just heard.
Watching the live data as the pandemic spread across the globe left us no doubt we are all part of a connected hyper-complex system, that little blue dot. Every action has a reaction and that reaction has a reaction. And as we were saying in the green room before this panel, it makes no sense at all to wait for someone else to change things. It's our responsibility to be informed, to really understand the decisions we make, whether that be in businesses or as consumers. It's our job to make sure that we're using technology for good. The opportunities for brands is immense. Doing good is good business. We need transparency to map open data. And the foundation of all of this is to build trust and resilience into our systems and frameworks. We need to try, test, fail, and try again. Remember, everything can always be better, always. So let's make sure that the new normal is a better normal. And with that, let me hand over to the Q&A. Want access to more COGX videos? Subscribe now for free at cogx.co.